that Simon Bird better know what he's doing because uh, uh, the way things are going um, he won't be making too many films in the future now Simon Bird's politics is less important than the spirituality of the artistry that he represents as with all visu extremely visual artists like him describing what he's done it makes a lot more sense if you've actually seen the material but of course very few people are entirely aware that this material exists even though uh, quite a lot of that and comes up on the internet almost instantaneously in English but the reason for this is because people understand what he is doing he's positioned himself to be the repository of the sort of sensibility which didn't come to an end in 1945 there's certain forms of German classicism that are not particularly relevant of it there are certain forms of German medieval art that don't really relate to it um, there's something rather trans-German and quasi-Catholic and German in the European sense, in Nietzsche's sense of uh, being European, as against German about him. There's not very much Protestant, in my view, about his art, aesthetically, for example. But he is the repository of the romantic Volkish sensibility, which people know is quintessentially German and yet is largely denied apart from tourism and a few prissy things now but it is ideologically denied in contemporary Germany what's wanted are endless novels of guilt and expiation and anti-romanticism and existentialism and writers like Michael Walser and Robert Walser and Elias Canetti's auto de fe and this sort of thing you know we've destroyed ourselves and we've deserved it this sort of stuff endlessly this is what's wanted needed, required um, expiation before the possibility of a primary statement even before the possibility of a primary statement it's the sort of Angela Merkel sort of um, uh, never be proud to say the new German without an enormous preliminary screed that almost has to be read out of apologetics before you can even get to the moment that you enunciate in a quiet voice now the truth is you can't create anything in a culture without that element of fire in the belly and without that element of prior authentication after German unification there were quite a few articles about Cyberberg there was one well known one by Daderich and, and Kometsky called Spiritual Reactionaries and their attitude towards the new German unification many people of course saw a great danger in the nationalisms petty and confused although some of them were that were released when communism was taken off and there was lots of ink spilled in allegedly quality journals all over the world about the dangers of this and that um, so Seidelberg had his moment in his film 19, in his book in 1990 it's also very important to consider his class position in a strange sort of way in post-war Germany um, the sort of Germany he came from his father managed estates on behalf of other people partly related to the people who owned them partly not that type of class background destroyed several times over really destroyed by the collapse of the second empire uh, finished off by the first war any savings pretty much decimated by the inflation which is probably why he was later his father was managing other people's estates um, the Weimar period was a sort of a, an interregnum that you just got through then there was a quasi-authoritarian semi-militarist governments between 30 and 33 then Hitler's chancellorship thereafter then the German world seemed to have come to an end with every city and every town in complete steaming rubble and uh, tens of thousands of corpses under the rubble so that when the sun came up in the summer there was an incredible stink of all the carrion because uh, first you had to get all the stone up and you had to bury them in lime pits and that sort of thing and this is before you could rebuild in accordance with what will be later called the German economic miracle um, that which had been destroyed before everything is a sort of simulacrum, a version, a, a film a virtual version, a virtual reality version of what existed it's sort of thunderbirds, you know, you blow it up, it's still there yeah. and that's why he sees everything as a film that's so why uh, the most outrageous thing of, thing of all, as Susan Sontag worked out 
long after she wrote her essay, Fascinating Fascism, is that maybe he regards the Shah as a film. Mm. A film. A film from Germany. A film from Israel. A film from Palestine. A film from Germany. Which, if you like, of course, a film's a fiction. But it can be truer than fact. Yeah. And more important than fact. Like a great religion is more important than fact. Because it can move millions of human beings to behave in ways they would never do otherwise. One man with an idea and with certainty is worth 50 other men. So, when you look at the, the artistic basis and the methodological premises of his cultural practice, as contemporary Marxist cultural studies types would call it, you suddenly see that there's something actually slightly insidious to liberal order. But my view is it's less conscious than semi-conscious, in my opinion, of his work, because he's somebody whose total focus in life is artistic. In a very German way, he's totalitarian about art. In a way, someone like Otto Dix was, for example. You know, it's sort of, uh, it's that desire to, not just penetrate to the core in the way that the Elizabethans in our own dramaturgy would like to do, but to actually go to the limit of what is possible to, it's what it's possible to say in the given trajectory. And his style, trajectory, would be what Wikipedia calls the dark side, mm. the dark side of German Romanticism. Oh. Mm. Now, is he, or can he at all be described as Lenny Reef and Stahl's heir? Firstly, the, I, the cinema that she made, the idea of uh, making anything comparable in post-war Germany is utterly unthinkable. Mm. It's unthinkable. Therefore, all that could ever be made is to approximate to the sensibility that she shows in her films as much before Triumph of the Will and Olympia, Parts 1 and 2, Festival of the Peoples, as, there, as is congruent with those works themselves. The first films were mountain films and films of extreme Aryan wistfulness in the sort of ex permafrost of the ice. Uh, she was a dancer before then. The last film is about Serenity of the Body and uh, opera, stroke operetta, and again a return to that which she knew best. When blocked, you go back. Always with her, you sense this um, yearning and transcendental idealism and a desire to attain archetypal perfection visually. She's an extreme visualizer and an extreme feminine visualizer, which is artistically unusual. And it's why Hitler chose her to make that film. In the teeth of all sorts of party opposition, Goebbels couldn't stand the idea initially that a woman would make the film, and was overruled. Because she viewed that movement with the, eye, with the religious eye, essentially speaking, of a female artist, which is why Hitler chose her. Because he wanted it seen in that way. And it's very rare for the male world, if you like, for an extreme version of part of the male world, to be viewed by the female artistic eye from without, uh, with technical ability of genius as well, editorially and so forth. This, I feel, is the comparison that can be made between him and her. But with him, likewise, there's a technical search for perfection, given monetary and budgetary limitations. 